We welcome you to the Rest Center in beautiful Green Bay, Wisconsin, as it's week one of the Indoor Football League playoffs. Two Rookie of the Year frontrunners go head-to-head -head as Tommy Armstrong leads the Nebraska Danger into Green Bay to take on Lenoris Footman and the Blizzard. I'm Alex Strofe alongside Joey Bonadonna on the Indoor Football League Network. Joey, happy Saturday. Hey, how you doing? Welcome into another episode of the Sports Hub right here on SBTV. I'm Alex Strofe alongside me, as always, Mike Wenjin, Jackson Jurek. Big news this morning, and what we're going we're gonna to lead off with that. Big news this morning, finally it's come to an end. It has finally come to an end. The holdout of Ezekiel Elliott has come to an end. America's team is fired up. Because the 24-year-old stud has agreed to a six-year, 90 million, that's 9-0, six-year, 90 million dollar extension through 2026, 50 million which of those dollars are guaranteed. He's pocketing 50 mils. 50 mil in his pocket, 40 of which he can earn on contract again. That contract goes through 2026. Uh, when Zeke will be 32, likely at the end of his career. We know how running backs are, and we'll jump into the value and whether or not it's worth it here in a second. But this is a huge move for obvious reasons. It's Ezekiel Elliott. Nobody has been Ezekiel Elliott since Ezekiel Elliott has entered the NFL. Nobody has been Ezekiel Elliott. Ezekiel Elliott has led the league in rushing two of the three years he's been in the league, has the most rushing yards of anybody since 2016, and he is likely, and I think this could be up for debate, but in my opinion, he's the most dominant running back of the last decade, maybe with exception to Adrian Peterson, and of course Saquon Barkley, who's likely that next dominant back. But Saquon's not there yet, Zeke is, and Adrian Peterson. However, he's still in the league. Uh, he's not what he was in 2008, 2009, 2010. I think he led the league in rushing in 2013 again. AP was dangerous. He was ridiculous. But Ezekiel Elliott is becoming that in Dallas. You look at Ezekiel Elliott, and you know what you've got. You've got a workhorse. You've got a guy who, when he stays out of legal trouble and he's on the field, you've got a damn good shot to win a football game because you've got Ezekiel Elliott. We talk about Jerry Jones, the owner, the GM of the Dallas Cowboys. We really thought the, the falling apart, if you will, of the Dallas Cowboys was here, right? We see Zeke calling out. We see the quarterback is pissed. See their top wide out who they just traded for is pissed. We thought maybe, and definitely five years ago when Romo couldn't stay healthy, when they couldn't make the playoffs, we thought this was it for America's team. Because when Jerry Jones came in 30 years ago, he bought the team in February of 89, when he came in, they were bad. And quickly he turned that thing around. He brought in Jimmy Johnson, and then comes Troy Aikman and Michael Irvin and Emmett Smith. And he brought in all these pieces, and all of a sudden this is a Super Bowl team. And then all of a sudden it all comes crashing down. And still in 2013... 2014, 2015, this team is one of two jokes of the NFC East alongside Washington. The Eagles were good. They hadn't won their Super Bowl yet at that point. The Eagles were consistently good in the 2000s and early 2010s. The Giants had won two Super Bowls in the last 15 years. And the Cowboys were still reflecting on how good the beginning of the 90s were to them. And then finally, finally a glimmer of hope. The 2016 NFL Draft, when they draft this stud out of Ohio State, Ezekiel Elliott. And then he doesn't get his way after three years in the league, being the best running back in the league. He jumps on a plane and says, eh, screw it, I'm going to the beach. I'm going 20 hours from here and I'm sitting on a beach until you give me my money. And we thought it was going to work from the get-go, right? I mean, I, I didn't hesitate to take Ezekiel Elliott and end of my fantasy drafts. I knew Jerry Jones was going to pay him. But 76-year-old Jerry Jones knows how to play poker very, very well. I think everybody else is playing Go Fish while Jerry Jones is playing freaking poker. Jones bought the team 30 years ago. Turns it into, you know, kind of, eh, into America's team. 
it seemed like the demise and the death was here. And now he's finding these franchise pieces, right? He just signed his ace. That's Ezekiel Elliott. But look at what the Cowboys have done since April. First, it was defensive end Demarcus Lawrence, five years, $105 million. extension. Five years. Extension. August, it was linebacker Jalen Smith, five years, 63 mil. Five-year extension. On Tuesday, it was right tackle Lael Collin, five years, 50 million. Extension. Are you listening to these years? Listen to these years. Five years. Five years. Five years. Now today, it's Ezekiel Elliott, six years. So when you grab your ace, now you're grabbing some other face cards. You're putting things together. You're putting a good football team on the field. It's risky. And I said we would talk about this and we should now. I know it's risky to sign running backs to a long-term deal. I mean, we talked about it. Ezekiel Elliott would be 32 years old when this deal expires. 32. Adrian Peterson and Frank Gore are the only running backs, I think, off the top of my head. I don't know this for a fact, but I think the only two running backs in the league right now over 32 years old are Frank Gore and Adrian Peterson. But it's Ezekiel Elliott, we mentioned it, two-time rushing leader, the leading rusher since 2016. And like I said multiple times, I'll say it again. I can't, I can't make this impact enough. Ezekiel Elliott is the most dominant back since the aforementioned AP. But now what do you do? Your quarterback's unhappy. He turned down 30, what was it, $30 million annually for $2 million annually, which is now what he'll play for. He's not holding out. But I, I think the move, and although I don't think he's a very good quarterback, you signed Dak Prescott. Now, Dak Prescott could go create leverage like Zeke did. Zeke went and sat on a beach, as we mentioned. Here's what Jerry Jones had to say when Zeke was sitting on a beach. Zeke who? (laughs) (laughs) He's got your camera. (laughs) He said, Zeke who? Zeke comes out and says, I didn't like that. The agent comes out and says, I didn't like that. Two weeks later, we've got a freaking deal. And did you hear what that reporter said right at the end? The reporter that asked the question, do you hear what he said right at the end of that clip I just played you? He's got you on camera. (laughs) He's got you on camera. And Jerry Jones didn't look around like, oh, I probably shouldn't have said Ziku. He looked around and he gave that 76-year-old multi-million dollar poker player smile. The evil smirk of Jerry Jones came out. And he said, yeah, I know he got me on camera. He didn't say that. But he smirked it. You saw it in the eyes. Yeah, I know he got me on camera. Even Zeke and the agent came out. We don't like that. We think that's disrespectful. That's not funny. Oh, 10 days, 11 days, 12 days later, we've got a freaking deal for 90 mil? Jerry Jones isn't playing go fish. He's playing poker. It's either a really close Wisconsin win or a Michigan blowout. I didn't think it would be either or. I thought it would be one or the other. Um, I thought it was either... Michigan blows out Wisconsin in Camp Randall. And I led toward the other way. I predicted a Wisconsin win, but I thought it was going to be much closer than it was. Much closer than it was. And uh, boy, was I wrong. And I don't like to say that. I don't like to say when I'm wrong, but boy, was I wrong. 35 to 14, the Badgers win. Uh, They were up 35 to zero at one point. And we'll get into what that means. Later, but but 35 to 14, the, the Badgers did not only beat Michigan. The Wisconsin Badgers did not only destroy Michigan. The Wisconsin Badgers did not only put the hopes of the college football playoffs for Michigan straight into the paper shredder. The Wisconsin Badgers effectively canceled any plan of Michigan being the powerhouse in Big Ten football for the next half decade. Next five years, nope, they're not the powerhouse. Michigan fans, they do tend to overreact. Michigan fans do, but they they want a total rebuild. They want Jim Harbaugh's khakis kicked straight off the sideline of the big house. Dylan McCaffrey and Shea Patterson, who split snaps, both solid quarterbacks, they looked absolutely lost uh, within Harbaugh's system. Saturday. Just lost. They they didn't look like the three, four, five star recruits they were. And they they look lost until uh, late in that third quarter and into the fourth when their comeback effort was much, much too late. The monkey 
that's been on Jim Harbaugh's back since his first season with this team in 2015. It wasn't that he lost his first game as the man in Ann Arbor. Uh, he lost his first game as the head coach to then pathetic, uh, then pathetic Utah team. It wasn't the fact that it took two tries for this legendary Wolverine, this most recently at the time, great NFL head coach who just came off of a Super Bowl run a few years prior. It wasn't the fact that it took him two tries to get into the W column. The monkey on Jim Harbaugh's back has consistently been O-H-I-O. It's constantly been Ohio State. Constantly. Couldn't beat him in 2015. Couldn't beat him in 2016. Couldn't beat him in 2017. Couldn't beat him in 2018. And he's not going to be able to do it in, in 2019. And it wasn't like they overlooked the Badgers. You knew this was going to be a good game. You knew the Badgers were really freaking good going in. But it's it's no longer the monkey. The monkey is no longer a pesk on Jim Harbaugh's back. That monkey, after this loss on Saturday, becomes a resident. A resident living rent-free on the back of this Michigan legend. If Jim Harbaugh doesn't beat Ohio State later this year, I'm not sure he's coming back to Michigan. And when this hire was made in 2015, again, I call these Michigan fans, I, I say they tend to overreact, which they do, but this was like Vince Lombardi was reincarnated and named the head coach of Michigan when Jim Harbaugh was brought back because this is a guy that could do no wrong. Jim Harbaugh is an absolute legend in Ann Arbor. And when this hire was made in 2015, recently going to the Super Bowl, everybody was like, oh, my goodness, Michigan, watch out. Michigan, Michigan, Jim Harbaugh, khaki pants. Oh, boy, right? That, that was the reaction in 2015. And now in 2019, just three weeks into the season, they want him going. It's less than four and a half years total. And I get it. I get the frustration. Because Harbaugh was supposed to instill this no-loss mentality within Wolverine Nation. And that hasn't been the case. This isn't a team that has gone to the college football playoff in the last four years. Like, they probably should have. This is a team that can't beat Ohio State. And that's all. Jim Harbaugh's greatness is overshadowed by that. And now this is a very dark blemish in the career of Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. And that monkey has doubled inside and, like I said, is now living rent-free as a resident on his back because if Michigan does not beat Ohio State later this year and they finish the season with them on November 30th, Harbaugh's gone. I, I'm, I, I don't see any other way. If you can't beat Wisconsin, who, and we'll get to Wisconsin in a second, like I mentioned, if you can't beat Wisconsin, if you can't beat Ohio State, what are you playing for, right? You're not playing to go to the Fiesta Bowl, Jim Harbaugh. No, you're Michigan. You're playing to go win a national championship, and that's not the mentality, nor has it been the result we've seen over the last four and a half years. 15 on the shot clock, 342 on the game clock as Greenheck inbounds it to Collins in the left corner. Top of the key now, Serato. No look past to Slowick on the right wing. She'll give it back to Greenheck on the left wing. Under five now on the shot clock. Serato needs to get rid of it. Collins will pull a three. Bang! We've got a tie ball game. As Bailey Collins knocks home a three-pointer only her second of the year. Now two for ten from outside. Five to five, three ten on the clock. As Higgins gets it up top to Campbell, left side. Back to Higgins, who will control the top of the key under 18. Leah Porath, the leading scorer, looks inside for the big Carson Reith, left side. Oh, and that doesn't have enough mustard on it. As Greenheck boards it and speeds the other way. Jessica Slowick back to Greenheck, right side now Moran. Playing ring around the rosy as Serato keeps her right side, dribbles inside left hand, looks back to Collins, who thought about another three, crossover, back out to Serato, who does pull a three, bang! And Stevens Point has their first lead of the game. Eight to five now, Pointers lead. Under the three minute mark in this first quarter. Porath now to Higgins, top of the key. 
Emily Higgins kicks it right side, Olivia Campbell. Now playing ring around the rosy are the Titans of their own. Poe Rath left, right side, left hand dribbles, air ball. It might have gotten a pointer's deflection as Jessica Slowick tippy-toed around that ball. So did Collins. This ball's flying around the ring. And somehow Stevens Point came up with that possession. That was wild. That was crazy. It was like pinball on a basketball court as Green Heck will set it up for the pointers. 20 on the shot clock, two on the game clock. Moran will drive baseline right side. Pivots and goes up with it, and a traveling violation called the second of the game on the pointers. A couple of big shots right there by the pointers, one by Bailey, one by Carly Serrato, and they got themselves a lead, a quick 6-0 run here after a long period of time where there was not a lot going on. Pointers and a little bit of pinball going on made things interesting here in the last three minutes of this basketball first quarter here. Absolutely. Kellen Schmidt will check back in for Bailey Collins, so she'll have her hands full with Emily Miller, who's also checked back in for the Titans. Olivia Campbell remains the one wearing number one for UWO as she brings it up. Kicks it right side to Higgins, who's going to use that right baseline, fakes it back outside a wide open three ball taken bang for the UWO. And they respond with a three of their own. Does Nikki Arneson now with five? Eight to eight, a minute and a half remaining now in the first quarter as Greenheck takes it up, a handoff to Jess Slowick. Right side now, Greenheck. She'll dribble left hand and kick it top of the key to Schmidt. Left side now, Amber Bayman. She thinks about it, triple threat position. Now we'll dribble it around at the top of the key. Slowick with the tape on the right wrist will drive. Crossover left hand went up and she was fouled. So she'll go to the line for two. Foul will go on Emily Higgins. That's her first, team third for the Titans. And this tie ball game, Jessica Slowick, the sophomore, will have the opportunity to change that. Good take by there, Slowick, in getting the foul with a chance to give the pointers a lead here in the closing seconds of the first quarter. So the first to two, the ball spins in Slowick's hand. She off front rim. That one's no good, so the score remains 8-8 eight to eight with a minute 19 here in the first quarter. Slowick doing a routine. She spots up, and she'll take her second of two free throws. That one's up, and she sinks that one for a pointer's lead. 9-8 to eight with 118 and counting remaining. Campbell will take it up right side. Shimmies with it and kicks it right side to traveling violation of their own for Oshkosh. That one called on Abby Kaiser, the sophomore from Potosi. It's a fun school to say, Potosi. Here's Greenheck now, pointer's ball, 70 seconds left in the first. Slovak right side, defended by free tag. Top of the key to Moran. She'll dribble right hand, quick pass to the left side to Bayman. Bayman in between the legs, getting tricky with it, backing her man down, and she'll kick it back out to Moran from the free throw line. Top of the key to Slovak, right side all the way, and she's fouled once again. Was she in the act of shooting though? It looks like they will say no, sir. That foul will go on Nikki Arneson. That's her first. Moran will inbound for the pointers with 52 seconds on the game clock. It'll go to Greenheck, top of the key. Picks up her dribble quickly, but finds Moran right side. Back to Greenheck now, top of the key. Left hand all the way. Switches hands. No, sir. Off the backboard, it'll go out of bounds and in favor of Oshkosh with 41 seconds left in this first quarter. Here comes Olivia Campbell. We're under the 42nd mark. And she's going to hesitate. Back to the top of the key to Arneson. Now left side to Kaiser. Kaiser will dribble. Now to free tag. Top of the key. Now Arneson. Right side to Campbell. Playing it around the top are the Titans as they have about a 10-second differential between shot and game clock. Emily Miller underneath. A skip pass to a wide open Campbell for three. Back iron. Too much mustard. But Arneson comes up with the board and puts it right back in as the Titans regain the lead. Under 10 seconds now. Here comes Amber Bayman right side. Six, five. Top of the key to Greenheck who drives. Spinning. Two, one. Up and no good. And that'll do it. After one quarter of play, the Titans lead 10 to nine. That was a fun little end of that first quarter there, Jackson. That's it for sports this week. Next up is Florence Anderson with entertainment. Thanks for kicking it with me. I'm Alex Stroh for SBTV Sports. Thank you as always for hanging out with me. My name is Alex Stroh. You can find me on Twitter at Alex underscore Stroh. Let's chat sports because I like doing that. Uh, but with that said, until next week, this has been Sports Beat on 90 FM. Thanks for watching, Alex, Mike, Jackson, and company. We'll see you next week on the Sports Hub. Until next time, Stevens Point, with love and happiness, good night. <laughs>